Washington Improv Theater's show, Lore, where we focus on storytelling and bring all sorts of inspiration and narrative from storytelling. To start off, I just want to quickly introduce myself and the Lore cast. I'm Michael. Mark. Jules. Catherine. Sam. John. Green. So in tonight's show, we're going to tell some stories, but we're going to get a lot of the ingredients and the ideas from you guys. So if you look down in your lap, you have a menu. <laughs> that menu is going to have some of the formats we'll do tonight, and you will get to choose what those are. So if you look down, we're going to take a practice. Uh, at the end of every form, we're going to say, what's next? And you can shout out whatever seems like the most fun or whatever you want to see next. So we'll just run a practice. Uh, what's next? <laughs> we 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 awesome. Nailed it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. So, what's first? Directions in God! I heard direction. came out real fast. Uh, so, for this game, uh, we are going to be directing a story. And it is going to be told in one single voice, but by the entire lore cast. But if there's any flaws, I want you to say die. We're going to take turns telling it, and if somebody drops off or says a word and the other person repeats a word or says something nonsensical afterward, you guys can shout die, and that person will collapse on stage, removed from the story. Uh, so I'll be looking for you to call out any flaws that you see. Um, to start off, can I get the name of a story that has never existed before? Crispy Crimes. It's definitely Crispy Crimes. <laughs> Crispy Crimes. Juan enjoyed making donuts more than anything at the bakery, and so he was so pleased when the boss finally let him go to the store to get the best flour that he could find. It cost about $85 a pound. But Juan didn't care, because if it was the best, it was going to make the best Cookies? <laughs> <laughs> she liked better than he liked donuts. He didn't tell his boss. He had like this complicated thing where he would always eat the donut that he brought to work, but then he would tell his boss that he really wanted to make more donuts that was the best thing <laughs> he could do, but it was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> he really wanted to make cookies. So he decided to make a huge. Oops. Oh, you are. Oh. <laughs> 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 They're on tonight, so think this little bit, just kill him off. <laughs> <laughs> Juan had a girlfriend named Juana <laughs> across the street at the cosmetics store. <laughs> Juana was not into him trying to mess around with his boss's uh, M.O. and told him that he should just go with the flow. And just, you know, make the donuts. And she didn't want to work her whole life. Because she was poor when she was born. <laughs> and had no idea what it was like to just be... have a job and, you know, be a person. <laughs> <laughs> so, she said, Juan, if you get fired, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> so Juan got fired the very next day. And she said, well, here goes. And she beat him to death. So Juan died, but in Juan's apartment. And so she thought, what next? Because I need to keep the body warm. <laughs> so she dressed up like Juan and brought his body to him. <laughs> and put it in the back of the deep fryer, which is larger than most uh, bakeries. <laughs> what he wants is that those cookies were a huge hit. And Yes! <laughs> Wanted to eat those cookies, but they were made of Juan! <laughs> Juan, now Juana's boss, was like, you've got to replicate this recipe. I've never really looked at it. What you were putting in, but it sounds cool. What are you going to do? So she realized she was going to have to keep killing people. <laughs> Just coming into the store. <laughs> Walking down the sidewalk or working at the... She realized that... <laughs> Over the years, Juana grew more and more beautiful. She was working both jobs at the cosmetics store and the bakery, and she became the most beautiful plus size baker in the world. Still, you can order her cookies, but be careful. <laughs> Oh. 
So be there, she said be there somewhere around here. Thank you so much. So do you have a favorite fairy tale? Uh, in mind, something especially dear. Cinderella. Cinderella. So great. We all know the story of Cinderella, but what's a little less known is the story of Flumferella. <laughs> Flumferella. So tonight we're gonna hear the story of Flumferella. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful woman named Flumferella, and every day she would wake up in the morning and throw her covers off, run up to the mirror, and kiss herself. Kiss her a bunch. Flimferella was known across the land as being the vainest woman in the village of Dwarfen. And she ran around town trying to get all of the men to get her attention. But this led to some interesting circumstances. And because of that, none of the men were really interested in her. Uh, for um, they all listened to Tupac, and as Tupac <laughs> says, uh, I hate to sound sleazy, but tease me. I don't want it if it's that easy. <laughs> <laughs> so she decided to listen to hip hop and just take it more seriously and see if it could help her with her deep-seated narcissism. But it turns out that hip hop is terrible if you're trying to cure yourself from deep-seated narcissism. <laughs> so she decided to listen to classical music. She just thought she would try something new in her favorite. What was her Yeah, she did, she did. She just went so deep inside of herself and stopped thinking about what others wanted out of Funfarella and what Funfarella wanted out of her. But Wagner is dark. <laughs> so one morning, Funfarella woke up and she didn't have the energy to throw her covers aside. She didn't have the energy to move her limbs. <laughs> Funfarella felt like a block of cement. She was graying in color and taking on the looks of a block of cement. <laughs> she would blast Wagner and spend days in bed. What resulted was that the men that she'd once wanted to seduce started a petition uh, to get her bathed and or eliminated. <laughs> that was so bad, and the tales were just so chilling about this woman up in this house listening to Wagner all the time. It was a problem. The men were extremely desperate in this village, and they surrounded her house, all 50 of them. They had a large wooden tree that they fashioned into a spike, take down from Pearl's door once and for all. And then one among them actually stepped out. He was the town bather. <laughs> <laughs> and he told them, men, need us not resort to violence. We must accept and cleanse her. And so he went up alone, because no one else would go with him. And he did his work. And from that, that day forth, they lived as man and wife. <laughs> Bather and narcissist. And, <laughs> and rescuer. The end. The end. <laughs> Shoot each other. <laughs> 
in the people who eat it, and it has um, been through a number of series of updates in the recipe, uh, and still has a lot of lawsuits going. <laughs> Alleged illegal ingredients. Strychnine. Arsenic. Formaldehyde. Gunpowder. <laughs> Lead. Butter. Citation needed. <laughs> Preparation of six-gun chili. To prepare six-gun chili, you take six habanero peppers and you crush them between the fingers of an eight-year-old boy in order to get the sweat and the innocence that eight-year-olds have. You mix them in with some paprika, four cups of tomato sauce, and let sit for two hours. Proceed to find three green peppers, leave them in a trash can in three consecutive eight-degree days. At the end of those three days, grab the smelliest chili. That one goes in six guys. <laughs> At this point, the toxic cocktail described above is added. Click here to see a video of a man eating six guys. 
Are you ready? <laughs> of course I'm ready. Yeah. Why? Why is this a big deal? Why Take you got a scoop? On? <laughs> 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 you it out your ears. <laughs> Uses other than consumption. Taking the paint off of a wall where lead is suspected to be there. <laughs> During World War II, six-gun chili was dropped behind enemy Japanese lines as a trick. It was advertised as if it was American rations and resulted in a significant upper hand in the American forces during the war. <laughs> Citation needed. <laughs> this is uh, thought to be the inspiration behind the hit long-running Japanese game show, Chili Fun Time, where a caustic <laughs> substance is thrown into people's faces as they go down a water slide. <laughs> <laughs> Click to see a photo of toxic fun time. <laughs> <laughs> Cut back. <laughs> <laughs> lawsuits. There have been several major lawsuits against Six Stone Chili. The first major one came in 1972 by the Burbank Corporation, which alleged that using Six Gun Chili to feed its customers caused irrational outbreaks of herpes within a small population in Sacramento, California. And this issue was Burbank. settled out of court. Burbank County versus Reddy McGee. The next was against Shaw Elementary School, who were told that their, the chili would have, was, was part vegetable. And so they, they got all through their cafeteria and the children just made a mess of the entire place that it took 50 janitors to clean up the elementary school. References to Six Gun Chili in popular culture. Six Gun Chili was used as a plot device in the 37th episode of The Brady Bunch to describe <laughs> food that Janet didn't want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Season 3, episode, episode 12 of Knight Rider, one of the bad guys used Six Gun Chili to try and defeat Kit. <laughs> <laughs> In season two, episode four of Blossom, she gives her brother Joey a bowl of six gun chili after he fails an elder test. <laughs> Nicholas Cage wrote a screenplay for a movie that was never made called Six Gun Chili Down Under. The rights are not owned by anyone at this time. <laughs> See also Kansas uh, fast food chains. <laughs> chili. <laughs> Foods too dangerous to consume daily. Unlawful deaths. Strange weapons. For this game, we need a location where there would be a group of people gathered. Dungeon. So, dungeon. Steve got out. 
<laughs> Steve was on the management track at Staples. <laughs> Always on time. Aren't you both on the management track? Yeah. Yeah, we went to that training at the Holiday Inn last week. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was really informative and well done. <laughs> That's close, then. The Holiday Inn training is close. He took a Myers Briggs test. <laughs> Did you guys take that? ENTJ? Crematorium. Uh, <laughs> Go! Thank you. 
Oh my god, uh, Smith House is a wonderful place to work. Um, everybody just is really mission focused, and we know what we're there for. You know, and it's great to wake up in the morning and know you're part of a team, and at the end of the day, you're going to see the results. Oh, <laughs> so there are lots of options for urns, but everyone always goes with the chest. <laughs> Nancy said, whatever you do, don't put me in the ground. And I was like, Nancy, I get that. Same for me. She went first. And I know she's in a better place, so I'm not sad, but I'm also not going to bury her. I'm going to turn her into dust and drop her off in Galapagos Islands so she can be with the turtles, and I'm going to do it tomorrow. I felt a little ridiculous going because it was just a cat. Now, I say just a cat, but that cat was my life cooking. Cooking. And um, they took such good care of me there. I mean, I felt like the cat might have died, but the cat had been replaced with the whole family. She paid a lot of money for Cookie. I've never seen someone as the manager there for six years put that much money into the cat. She had an urn. She set up sort of a ceremonial shrine that we had in the back. But they tell you to shop around, and that's the kind of thing that you can't do after the fact. So uh, I went to a lot of places when I was putting my will together. Um, I went to a normal cemetery. Uh, I went to a hospital where they take bodies. And then I went to the crematorium. And there was just an interesting cross-section of people there. There was a <laughs> lady with a cat. It was very sad. And there was a young person. And you don't like to see that. And I was like, uh, can I see myself? So the meowing, right? You know, Cookie, you know, we do pets. We use the same incineration chamber as for people. I mean, people share their whole lives with pets. Why wouldn't they share a burning fireball? <laughs> um, and Cookie's procedure was normal, A-OK, -okay, no problemo, into the... It's not know, just fire. I get up at 545 every day, and I get it up going to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's not 2,000, you're going to get teeth, you're going to get bones. It's going to be messy. These people want dust and fine ash. I take my job seriously. I wear the same pair of overalls every day. By 5.30 a.m. One thing I was pleasantly surprised by was um, when I did get the urn, and it was platinum. Uh, <laughs> the contents, not the urn itself, but the contents weighed 30 pounds. Oh. And she was not satisfied. <laughs> she took one little whiff inside her expensive urn, so I wasn't going back for her, but she said, these are the wrong remains. <laughs> and I said, madam, that's impossible. <laughs> As Nancy and Cookie's attorney, I thought it was important that the lawsuits <laughs> set a precedent that you can't bring a cat to a crematorium and have a 30 pound urn come out. <laughs> that just doesn't happen, and I'm here to solve and make sure that this crematorium does not do this to future cats. Now, I feel badly because I read about that in the newspaper, and if I can be this is the thing, I, you know, you really want to try something out, but again, I'm pre-shopping, and I'm not going to be there for when I actually have to go. So I just had a small ham, just a small ham I brought with me, and I just wanted to slide it up to the conveyor belt. <laughs> I just wanted to get an idea. <laughs> and I have to think that that poor lady might have gotten my ham in addition to I think, I think. <laughs> Putting all sorts of weird shit in us, the flames. And, they, and we were just like, whatever, we'll burn it. We'll burn anything. <laughs> we started sucking things in that weren't even supposed to go in there. And we put them all into one and we pushed them out. To the urn had the distinct scent of bacon. <laughs> 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 My cat never ate bacon. It's a very strict diet that my maid prepared every day for her. Fresh chickens. Well, I was prepared at the Honey Ham Factory. I never thought I would end up in the urn of a cat. Maybe a hungry family as a holiday gift for their Christmas. Maybe I'd be given out at a homeless shelter to help some people. But instead, I was put on the conveyor belt, sent up into a 2,000 Fahrenheit degree flaming fire, and put in an urn with a cat named Cookie. And I thought, 
It. Gus says he's taken the whole chamber apart and put it back together again, and uh, there are no traces of where that sound is coming. I think it's something spiritual. <laughs> it's just sort of giving a blessing to everyone in Smith House. It's like we all have a collective sort of demon cat. <laughs> and um, I mean, if you're going to work with incinerating, are your microphones captured? <laughs>
There was so much milk to be delivered in Smithton <laughs> that two milkmen worked every route. All of the households drank lots and lots of milk. I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Rewind this so that it needs to be doing great. Soy milk was soon. <laughs> There were two milk men. <laughs> There's so many different demands for types of milk in these. these 20 farms. years ago, Ted, 20 years ago, I had the whole city. Just me. Mm. Not anymore. Yeah. Well, I have to thank Jenny for that. You know, when you came in and told people that there were other kinds of milk, it blew minds. <laughs> they were like, well, what, who else are we gonna milk? Cats? <laughs> and he said, no, there's also lactose in that. And so we started <laughs> So we started milking all sorts of nuts and things. <laughs> I owe my life to you. Okay? <laughs> it was time for Jenny to, to pay for their services. They offered her two alternatives. We take cash. Or you can take a, a route with us <laughs> and show you. Know, we'll show you the ropes. Maybe you can pick up on this business since you started it. What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah. Take the route. I can't do heavy lifting. Cash. 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 Drive the car on the road. <laughs> I'll do that. Okay. Well, she's gotten the cash, but she's also going to be the driver. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Winner to page 13. Sweet ride, Jenny. Damn. You really Don't pulled out some stuff. Sorry. Please, drive this. We've, we've never driven before. <laughs> so Jenny started Small driving. Thing. She had a full tank of gas. Room 5 was playing on the radio. <laughs> and she came to a fork in the road. In one direction was a dark forest. Bats flying in every direction. That's much faster. In the other direction was San Francisco. <laughs> they need milk too. I have a feeling which one you're going to pick. Perfect. Let's go. But the wind blew them suddenly hard to the left. Whoa, this car is accident. It plunged into the forest. Whoa. Down the road. Whoa. Turn to page 24. <laughs> Welcome, Jenny. <laughs> Bet you thought you were going to San Francisco. <laughs> I'm not the one in charge. That's the one in charge. Well, you can talk to me and I'll relay the message. <laughs> You're in Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
the gas tank was now half full, and Eric Clapton's greatest hits were playing. <laughs> should Jenny continue listening to Eric Clapton, or should she change stations? <laughs> she chose to change stations. Turn to page 80. Oh, oh, sit oh, in the duck of oh, <laughs> Reaction as lactose does to me. <laughs> You're killing him. Should you turn it off? <laughs> no, she doesn't want to turn it off. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, Jenny <laughs> continued listening to <laughs> Sitting by the Dock of the Bay. One of the milkmen perished. Tell Jenny not to use the perished. Perished. Yeah. <laughs> it fell
Thank you. I think you said fan fan, nice and loudly. So has there been any of the stories or forms you've done so far that you particularly enjoyed? Or you are your favorite? Um, Cinderella. Cinderella. Do you have a favorite character in Cinderella? Fimferella? Fimferella. Fimferella. <laughs> we're gonna the way new show with Frimperella, we're gonna bring her back and see what happened a little later on. I still need to be washed. <laughs> I'm still filthy and disgusting. I'm just gonna no, no, no. no I'm gonna get back in bed. No, but you feel you're spiraling. <laughs> I'm so sorry you left. Men are terrible. I had to cover up all the mirrors again. <laughs> I was so pretty. Wasn't I pretty? Can we talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> you were so pretty. Knock, knock. Who is it? The launderer. Oh. Here are your sheets. We've cleaned them. <laughs> Took five days. What's that about? Well, a lot of dirt and grime and ground into the sheets. You should really think about laundering them more often than every three months. Well, you should show up more than every three months. I come when I'm called. Oh, I didn't know you guys were secretly screwing. <laughs> 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 Who could 
withstand my pressure. <laughs> and it was as if those words were a magic spell, thinking that she had actually gotten a man, restored from Ferella to her youthful, self-appreciative beauty. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just shower without me looking? <laughs> I showered from the inside. <laughs> the only place I could never really clean you. It's true. Oh, <laughs> I just want to rip the sheets off the mirrors really quick. Oh my god! Oh my god. You're radiant. You're the only one here to appreciate that. She was gorgeous, and the men from her surrounding area, somehow heard of her beauty and lined up at her door to get in. This is how I like it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Hi. yeah. Yeah. I'm back. Boom, boom, boom. Merci. 
He said, Bienvenue, which again was uniquely Canadian, because that's sort of a French way to say an English word, and they wouldn't do that in France. <laughs> Pierre saw through me, though. He saw, he saw through me in my towels, and he said, I think you need seven or more towels. So there I am, looking covered in towels. And <laughs> <laughs> the towels. I'm like, lost me. He so, called me a mummy. That was his little pet name. <laughs> Your mummy, eh? <laughs> I started wrapping them tighter and tighter, and I found it hard to breathe. He said, I'm sorry if this hurts. <laughs> sure, I couldn't breathe at all. It was hot, and I was covered in towels. I didn't care. So don't say sorry. You don't have to be sorry. <laughs> but I wouldn't mind another towel. <laughs> did I have another towel? I said. Of course he did. Of course he had tons of big towels. <laughs> Seven more towels were brought in immediately by a gang of like looking sweaty towel boys. <laughs> My whole body, member and all, were quivering under the weight of fluffy towels. They picked me up, five of them. Each on either, all the ends of me. <laughs> <laughs> and they threw me in the laundry basket. That was their little nickname for me. Laundry basket eight. <laughs> Somewhere between being dropped and landing in the basket, I came. So I needed another towel. <laughs> I never saw my French teacher again. <laughs> Sexy times, is, is it okay to, for me to shirk my education to get it on? Quebecois. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we. Oui. I hope you say. <laughs> the end. <laughs> I get a suggestion for an object. Metro bus. Metro bus. <laughs> in this, you're going to see a bazooka bubblegum comic strip. You've opened up and there's two <laughs> panels. Here they are. <laughs> we see a bus, uh, a bus steering wheel. A puddle of urine lies in the middle of the aisle. <laughs> a woman checks the next bus to see if that's the bus she's on. <laughs> <clears throat> A driver stands ready with the doors open. <laughs> An asshole leans against the pole. An advertisement encourages you to check yourself for lumps. <laughs> A discarded New York Times lays on the ground the sports page in the puddle. <laughs> Next panel. A man stands in a metro train. A door nails somebody. Control levers in the conductor's cart. A seven-year-old boy's head is trapped in the door. <laughs> <laughs> Already, you can see the lumps are forming. <laughs> An asshole leans against the pole. <laughs> the sign over here says, see something? <laughs> it's the year 2016 and a woman waits to board the streetcar. <laughs> Boringly checks the weather on his eyeballs. <laughs> a biker, desperately trying to outrace the, the streetcar and getting caught in the little groove in the road. An asshole leans against the pole. The asshole is peed himself. <laughs> a ten-year-old boy with a crooked neck reads a copy of the Jess. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for being here. What a terrific audience you
you've been. Uh, there are more performances of lore. You can come back and see it again. It'll be a completely different show. The structures that we didn't get to tonight, you can yell them out, and we'll get to them that show. Uh, please tell your friends, tell your loved ones about the show. Uh, we're, we're, we're still building audience, and uh, this kind of work, this so sort of storytelling and narrative focus, it's pretty rare in the world of improv, uh, and so we're trying to get as many different audiences as, as we can to see it. Uh, Washington Improv Theater is a nonprofit. It was started 15 years ago by just a group of people who thought that Washington needed to play a little bit more. Uh, now, cut forward 15 years, uh, we've got a classes program that's bringing improv to over 1,000 students every year. We've got a family of over 300 artists who perform each year on Wit Stage exploring this craft. We hope you'll come back and explore more Wit programming. We know you're going to explore more fringe shows. And please, if you've got it in you, if you've got the resources, think about making a charitable donation to WIT tonight as you leave through the lobby. Thanks again. Wonderful audience. Good night.